So hi, good morning everyone, and welcome to this Foundational Community Supports training um, on the ISP intervention development. So we're going to talk about development of interventions for ISPs and then also interventions as they're going to be done for, um, for clients in FCS. Um, so my name is Shelley Bookbinder, um, and I'm going to be facilitating today's training. Um, I'm with the Rutgers School of Health Professions Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. Um, and we are being contracted by the Washington State Healthcare Authority to provide these six trainings. Um, and I'm happy to be here um, this morning with all of you. Wonderful. So... A little bit again to rehash the training basics. So for audio and video, I muted everybody upon entry, um, but please connect to audio. Um, so if you don't have computer audio, we're asking you to connect to call in um, so that you will be able to um, participate. We are going to have um, one very short breakout group um, but if you're not able to, um, to do it in a breakout group, I'm going to give you an option to do it independently. So hopefully that will um, alleviate any of the issues with the breakout groups. I know that they're hard for some people, other people really like them, so I'm trying to, to balance that. Um, again, you can choose to have your video on or off. We ask that if you do have your video um, on that, you know, you have an appropriate background and, and dress. Oh. Oh, so Linda, um, the number that I put 301 is what you would call into, and then the meeting ID is the 940. So that should be the correct information to be able to call in. So Linda, I hope, so I just put it to everyone um, in the chat box. So that 301-417-8592, that's the number to call into, and then the meeting ID follows it. So I hope that that works for you. Um, so again, we're going to use the chat as the main form of communication, except in the breakout group. Um, I am recording this webinar, as I mentioned, and the recording and presentation will be sent out by the Healthcare Authority of Washington State. Um, has, have any of you received um, any of the materials that we've sent out? You haven't received. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to do a follow up. I have a note to myself to follow up because we've been sending them the presentations. I'm so sorry to hear. It's why we've been sending you the links to the resources um, during the presentation so you have access to them. They haven't received, okay, you asked me. I emailed last week. Okay, so Melanie, thank you for, I'm gonna check in with our contacts in Washington State. Okay, um, this is good to know. I know Emily had checked two weeks ago. Um, Yeah, so in terms of the question about can we leave ourselves unmute unless talking to the group? Yes, I think you should leave yourselves muted for sure. And the only time you would unmute yourself is during the, the breakout, the time in the breakout group. So I hope that answers your question, um, Simone. Okay, so um, any other questions before we, we get started in terms of audio, any logistics? So again, in the chat, I'm doing my best to, to monitor that and stay, uh, stay on top of that. Okay, so again, this is the training series overview. Um, this is the fifth of six trainings that are all taking place on six consecutive Tuesdays from 9.30 to 11.30 um, Pacific time. Um, again, today is on intervention development, um, and I'm going to go through what specifically we're going to do in a moment. Um, and Emily will close us out with focusing on providing and documenting services next week. So she's going to talk about progress notes and also the concept of intentional services. So that will round out our Golden Thread training. Um, and we're very happy that um, so many of you have stuck with us for this entire training series. Okay, so um, just to reintroduce myself, um, it's been a couple of weeks. So again, my name is Shelley Bookbinder and I'm an education training specialist 
um, with the Rutgers School of Health Professions Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. Um, since we're talking about intervention development, a lot of what we're talking about today is teaching. Um, and I have a quite a bit of teaching experience. Um, so as I mentioned, I taught for um, six years at Queens College in New York City. And um, recently I just taught at Rutgers um, a methods class in social work um, on research methods. And it's incredibly challenging to teach, right? Whether it's teaching skills, whether it's teaching research methods. And um, something that I've learned um, over time um, is just the need to be flexible, right? Because you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what people's needs are. Um, and an example I'll give you from this past semester teaching research methods is it's the first time I taught master's social work students and um, I had an idea in my head I wasn't going to use PowerPoint and since and I checked in after a couple of weeks and was like how are things going and people are like we really need PowerPoint <laughs> and so I changed the way I was teaching right and I kind of, I was flexible to what they needed right and so you know thinking about the fact that like students uh, consumers you're working with are individuals who have different needs and learn in different ways um, is, is really important to think about with interventions. And I think um, I learned this. Oh, okay. Um, well, good luck with your webinar at 10. <laughs> um, yeah, so just lost someone. Um, yes. So that's something to be thinking about and how to individualize things and how to be responsive to people's needs is something that I'm sure all of you work with um, doing work in supportive employment and supportive housing. Um, but it's something I've struggled with and continue to struggle with. And so um, that's like a little bit about my background. Um, and yeah, so to check back in, um, you worked um, last week with Emily on SMART goals and objectives. And again, SMART, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Um, and she asked you in a learning application to check in on documentation over the course of the week to see our goals and objectives SMART. So I'm going to put that out to you. Um, you know, if you reviewed goals and objectives over the past week, you know, did you find goals that were smart or not smart? Um, and if someone has an example that they'd like to, to share, that'd be, that would be wonderful. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves to share, that's also okay. Um, if it's easier than typing it in, um, you can definitely do that um, if you don't have background noise. So um, looking back over documentation, did you find goals, objectives, smart or not? So just take a moment to, to think back over the past week and if you have an example of something that maybe wasn't smart or um, for our goal or objective or was smart. Some were not time bound. Okay, Sabrina. So it didn't say in the next three months, in the next six months. So having that either the course of the ISP, whether that's three months, six months, a year. So having that. Um, okay, Jordan, many were not measurable, becoming stable. Exactly what does stability mean, right? Is that being housed? Is that moving into an apartment? Is that getting a job? Like, that would that'd be something to make something more measurable, right? So that's that's exactly that kind of the same example Emily gave last week. I want to be happier, right? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, okay, that's a great example. Um, anything else in terms of seeing seeing not smart goals or objectives? And again, this is um, a requirement for um, for Medicaid documentation uh, for goals and objectives to be smart. So in New Jersey, we also have. The requirement of uh, SMART goals and objectives. So any other examples? Okay, so Joel, you did an ISP with a client and in doing our next skill or behavior plan was to evaluate house rules with her daughter and we actually looked at how to do this using SMART objectives. The mom was very open and able and it helped to strengthen the skill. I was not able to do this 
with my uh, previous notes. That's wonderful to hear that you brought her into that. That's, that's really, we had talked about that a little bit in terms of like, it might not be the way people, people don't think in SMART in terms of goals and objectives, but working through that, like what does it look like for it to be specific and measurable? That's really wonderful to hear. That's excellent. So wonderful. So I have some examples up here that I'm gonna put in terms of is something SMART? So, is the client goal, I will buy a house in the next six months, smart? So do you think this is smart? Why or why not? So Tina, you have no. So if you think no, why not? And so it's not measurable. But isn't it measurable that you buy a house or you don't buy a house? Is that measurable? Yeah, so oftentimes a goal of I will, oh, Tammy, that's excellent point. So it is measurable. So saying you will do something or not, I will rent an apartment, I will have a lease on an apartment, I will buy a house. Those are things that are measurable because at the end of six months, you can say I did it or I didn't do it. So saying, yes, Laura, it's not attainable, right? So for some people, it may be attainable, but for a lot of people, depending on finances, other situations, it's not an, it's not an attainable goal. So it's smart, right, in the sense that it's specific, it's measurable, it's time bound, but it's not necessarily attainable or relevant. Um, even though it might be a longer term goal for people. So that's something to think about, how something might be measurable, specific, and time bound, but it's just not attainable or relevant. So I'm going to do one more. So is the client goal, I will be healthier in the, six, in the next six months in SMART format? Yes, yeah, so Joel's saying no. So what's a way you can make healthier more measurable? It's not specific enough, yeah. It's also not measurable, right? What does it mean? How do you know if you're healthier or not or not in the next six months? So what's a way that this could become? What, how could healthier be made more specific and measurable? Okay. Work out three times, yeah. So it could be a certain amount of activities. You can make it more specific. I will run, I will weight lift, I will go to cardio classes at the gym. You can make it like that. What's another example of a way you could make it more specific and measurable? Meal prep twice a week. Yeah, so some of these are sounding a little bit on it. That, that's great, um, Anna or Anna. These, some of these sound like objectives. So they sound like a step towards something, but maybe for example, losing 10 pounds, right? I will go to counseling two times a month. So, right, so attending counseling and putting the number, I'll obtain a employment, that could be around, yeah, these are great examples, uh, Tammy, Muriel, yeah. So just trying to make it more specific and measurable. So does anyone have any questions about SMART or, um, it sounds like you, you were, some of you were able to take a look at documentation. Joel, it sounds like you were able to, to work with a client on, um, on working towards a more, um, a smart objective, um, which is a nice collaborative process. So Tommy, I will reduce my blood pressure by five points within the next six months. Yeah, so it's concrete, you, you can measure it and it's very specific as to what you're gonna do. And that might lead to objectives like changing your food, changing your, um, maybe going to a specialist, you know, different steps in order to get there. And that's where you would get the more specific, um, that's where you might get the more specific objectives with steps. So wonderful. So any, any questions about SMART? Um, It is a little bit, um, again, because it's not really in the words of the client necessarily, it does take some wordsmithing, but I think the example of um, working with somebody to make a goal or objective smarter is a nice way to go through that process if you have time and the person is, is interested in doing it. Um, okay. Cool. So now, once you have a SMART goal and objective, the, 
question is what interventions are going to go on your ISP? And then how are those interventions actually going to be done by perhaps you, by other staff, um, is what we're gonna talk about today. What are those interventions? How are those interventions performed? Um, so what we're gonna start with is a poll about I'd like to get to know a little bit to see um, what interventions you currently provide. Do you write them on plans? And so, give me a moment. No. Okay. So here is the poll. Do you write interventions on ISPs? Um, yes or no? Do you teach client skills? Yes, no, or unsure? If you teach client skills, how confident do you feel doing it? So that's a Likert scale. And have you been trained in or used the following evidence-based practices to provide FCS services? And this is an all that apply. Tell, show, do for teaching, motivational enhancement, cognitive behavioral techniques, illness management recovery, or none. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time and I will get a sense of uh, of what folks are doing. So thank you for, for completing this. Um, and you can also see what other folks um, in other parts of the state are doing. Okay, so I'm gonna give everyone about 30 more seconds. Um, so, oh, oh um, so somebody asked um, anonymously about what FCS is. So foundational community support is the overarching Medicaid fee-for-service program that includes supported employment and supportive housing. So um, FCS services would be any services you would provide in supportive um, housing or supported employment. So I hope that that, um, that answers the question. So anything we provide um, in that area. Okay, so I'm gonna close the poll now and share the results. So um, of those of you who responded, 73% um, said that you um, do write interventions for ISPs. So that's great to know. Um, and 85% of you teach client skills. Um, and so that's also great to target audience for what we're gonna talk about today. It's wonderful to have all this experience. And if you teach client skills, how confident do you feel? So 52%, I'm so sorry, my cat is on the table. So I'm gonna try to keep him out of the frame. But um, so do you teach client skills? Do, um, do you teach client skills how confident? 52% of you feel confident. 36% of you neutral, 3% um, not confident. So we're gonna work on some techniques around skills teaching, um, and maybe that might help those of you who are confident, but definitely hopefully um, those of you who um, uh, are less confident teaching. And then in terms of 58% um, of you have received some CBT training, that's wonderful. And some about 50, a little more than 50% motivational enhancement. Illness management and recovery, 15%, and tell, show, do, that's teaching, 27%. Um, We're actually going to talk a lot about teaching today, um, so that's wonderful. That seems to be one of the areas people haven't had as much formal training. So that's great to know um, going, into the, going into this. So what we're doing today. Um, so first, we're just gonna quickly go through um, types of FCS interventions. Again, FCS interventions, those are interventions for supported employment and supportive housing. Um, so kind of pre-tenancy, post-tenancy, um, what type of interventions are outlined um, under the state regulations. And then we're gonna describe methods of FCS interventions using evidence-based practices. So you have these, for example, in supportive housing, pre and post tenancy um, services being provided. So how do you actually provide those services through skills and resource acquisition? 
so we're going to go through, we're going to really focus on um, skills teaching. I'm going to supply you guys a skills teaching template, which might be helpful when teaching skills to record the steps. So we're going to go through that as a resource. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the stages of change framework um, to help select appropriate interventions. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you for bearing with me. There I am. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, this, um, I, my internet just went out for a second. So, but it's back on. So this may happen again. It just went out for a second. So please bear with me. I really apologize. Um, but um, there are outages all over New Jersey, but I'm going to do the best I can. So that's why I wanted to give you a, uh, my uh, power might go out. <laughs> It happens to you all the time, yeah. When I was, I, I grew up in rural, um, in rural New England, and we used to lose power a lot in the summers, uh, squirrels and other things. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the, the kindness. Um, so, um, okay, so we're going to get started back. Um, and it is recording. Excellent. So this is the graphic we've been showing every time we've done the training. Um, and what we're focusing on today is after people have identified personal goals, this is part of developing the individualized service plan um, as SMART was as well. And then this is part of providing intentional services. Yeah, Tommy, it is hard when we're doing everything online. There's so much pressure on the internet. I also feel like my, my laptop that I have for work is like, that it overheats all the time. It's like working too hard. So yeah, all this pressure of the online meetings and internet requirements. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's my own private internet, so it's not necessarily uh, the best. It's not like work quality internet, but uh, doing the best we can. Okay. So again, we're going to focus on interventions in the sense they're being developed for ISPs and then also you providing the services um, because a number of you still teach and write interventions on, um, on ISPs. So in terms of intervention development, um, I have some questions here that it might be good to think about in terms of writing development, um, developing uh, interventions for ISPs for those of you who do. So first of all, how will the intervention support the client's goal achievement? 
And so interventions, right, are what the staff will do to support meeting objectives that support meeting goals. And so the number one question is, how will these interventions support the client meeting their goals and objectives? And what skills need to be taught or practiced and what resources need to be acquired? So if you have someone, for example, who has a goal of in the next six months, um, I will take public transportation to all my medical appointments, right, that's their goal. What skills would need to be taught or practiced for somebody who has limited experience taking public transportation? Let's say they're in a city like Seattle that has a pretty decent um, bus transportation system, so they, they could do that. Um, so what type of skills might someone need um, to be able to take public transportation to, the, to all their appointments? Yeah, learn to ride the bus learning bus schedules yeah reading those bus schedules for anyone who's done it, it it can be very confusing weekend versus weekday peak versus not peak yeah so the bus schedule knowing how much it costs absolutely and sometimes you need exact change sometimes you need a card right all those kind of things that's knowledge about the system that's a great point um routes and stops that can be really confusing also, right, communication skills. So sometimes you have to ask the bus driver, oh, I'm new to taking the bus. Can you let me know when this stop is coming up? Because sometimes they don't announce stops. So, so communication skills um, of kind of etiquette around bus riding, how to sit, how to hold on to things, um, how to talk to other passengers, how to talk to the bus driver, lots of different skills depending on the person, um, and kind of what their um, levels of communication and comfort with communication. What are resources that might need to be acquired um, to be able to meet that goal of uh, being independent, independently riding the bus to appointments? Oh, absolutely, Melanie, that's really important, knowing how to get on time. And so like working backwards from the appointment and knowing like if the bus is late, if I miss a bus, all that kind of planning. That's huge in terms of like executive functioning and planning. A way to tell time. Yeah, absolutely. A, you know, if they don't have a phone with like on their phone, on a watch, a bus schedule. Yeah, and bus schedules can be really hard to come by. Um, in some places, you have to go to a specific place to get the bus schedule. A mask to ride a bus depending on where they are, but definitely um, in these times. Oh, yes how to get on the bus if you have a bike or to use a wheelchair. Absolutely, that's really important. And actually on the East Coast, we really don't have those bike racks. Um, and in New York, um, where I lived for a long time, New York City, you can't take bikes on buses. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's horrible. You can take them on subways um, if you can take them up and down the stairs, but you can't take them on buses. So that's a great resource. But yeah, how to get on and off, what the procedure for a wheelchair, where do you wait in line? That's a lot of different knowledge to know about the bus and to practice and absolutely. EJ, that's a great, great point. Um, other resources might be the person might qualify for a reduced fare um, card, right? And so in New York, if you're a senior or have a disability, yes, Joel, making sure they have the funds to ride the bus, figuring out how much they cost a monthly pass. Yeah, so a, a reduced fare card um, is definitely a possibility for some people if they qualify. So Kelly, yes, in Seattle, they do have, um, racks on the front of buses, they just don't in New York, <laughs> which is really silly because it's uh, a very bike friendly city, um, but there aren't any bike racks on buses. I know it's, it's very shocking. It's a huge, it's, I think it's the largest bus system in the country and there's no way to, and you can't also, if you're a child with a stroll, uh, 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 a parent with a stroller, um, you can't bring a stroller that isn't folded up onto a bus. And so if you have a child, you have to carry the child and the stroller up the bus steps. It's a, they don't make public transportation easy for people, we'll say. Um, I have a lot of experience riding public transportation. Um, I know, Sabrina, it's, it's, it, is, it is very shocking. Um, and that's New York, the biggest system in the country, you know, and they make it so difficult for people. Um, and it's also dangerous because some of the buses have four or five steps. You have to go up with a child and uh, the stroller. So getting back to supported employment and supportive housing. So how do you decide what interventions to include on an ISP for those of you who write them? 
Um, so how do you, so there are these questions you can ask, you know, what skills need to be taught, thinking about resources to be acquired, but thinking about like, do you have like a bank of interventions? Do you have some go-to things? Like how do you decide what intervention? Do you have to think about who's gonna be performing the interventions and what they know? Um, are there questions you ask yourself? Um, yeah, how do you know when you're writing the plan what, what to do? And if staff are gonna know Right. So information obtained during the biopsychosocial, absolutely, Dennis. Um, we also talked about the KSR, so that'll give you a sense of, um, of what people know. Um, so that might, so yeah, so on the assessment, that's gonna give you some information, absolutely. Joel would be your mental health assessment. Exactly. We talked about how people use different assessments. Some of you are at mental health agencies, some are community based agencies, some are housing organizations. So you come from a diverse uh, set of agencies and so you'll have different uh, forms of assessment. Mm -hmm. Do any of you think about who's going to be providing the interventions and whether they'll be able to? So some of you said you were trained in motivational enhancement. If a staff is going to be doing the services who hasn't been trained, do you think about training and what services somebody can provide? Does that go into the process? Okay, so based on the on the goals, yeah, that's that is the Lance. That's an excellent point that it really is determined by the goal. And to Dennis and Joel's point, the interventions are what people actually need in terms of support will come from your assessment, uh, your time assessing them, maybe for doing the KSR. Laura, also a great point. Um, there's always unknown barriers. Yeah, because people are complex and you don't know everything about people. Laura, that's an excellent, excellent point about the being terrified of elevators. Yeah, some people, you think they can ride public transit, but then they're afraid on buses or have issues around people being really close to them, not just during COVID. Um, but there's a lot of things that like until people are in that situation, they might not even realize um, how bad it is or that an elevator is needed to get to their job, right? Oh, the you know, it's on like the 10th floor. Um, and yeah, or, and maybe there's an accommodation with stairs, but that could be a real issue. Okay, so Joel, you've all been trained on your agency to do an ISP and the objectives, so we don't usually need to be trained to do them, but yes, it may be a new goal. We may need to learn how to write an intervention. Okay, so you've been trained generally, but there might be something that hasn't been provided before you might need additional training. So that's, uh, that is good to know. Just give me another moment. So, in general, most interventions that you're performing should be doing the following three things in line with psychiatric rehabilitation and expectations of, um, yeah, Medicaid's expectations and psych rehab's best practices. So we're going to stay with the um, taking public transit as an example of transportation. So most interventions should improve or restore functioning in a chosen environment. So if you were talking about taking public transportation, right, that could be maybe perhaps somebody took public transportation in the past and it's getting them back to restoring that ability to be independent, to go to a job, to go to appointments, to go to interviews for something, um, or it might um, improve functioning if they basically not never used public transit and had limited transportation before. So a goal is to increase somebody's ability to function. The second is to do with over doing for. So have people heard this um, expression before that you should be doing with somebody when you're providing interventions, not doing for them? 
So the example from transportation, if we're to stick with that. So in New Jersey, we get feedback that a lot of people feel like they're, um, they're taxi drivers, <laughs> that they drive people to appointments, to the supermarket, that that's sometimes the only reason clients want to see them is for transportation. And so that's doing for with transportation, transporting someone somewhere. They're not independent. They need you to do the transportation. Doing with would be helping somebody learn about the bus, learning the bus schedule, learning communication skills, getting a fare card, doing budgeting to make sure they can afford it. That's teaching somebody to be more independent because they won't need you at the end of learning how to use public transit. So in New Jersey, we talk a lot about doing with when we're teaching, not doing for. The last, the last thing is to use teachable moments. So in the case of taking public transit, right, a teachable moment is using an everyday environment to teach skills. And so when you're taking for those of you who have taken or take public transit, what are some unexpected things that might come up while you're taking public transit? An example I've had is I've waited and a bus just doesn't show up, right? There's one scheduled to come and I sit and I wait and nothing comes, right? So that could be an issue. What are some other issues taking public transit that could be unexpected? So I'll give people a moment. So in the case of um, a bus not coming, right, um, what, what would I do, right? Would I just be like, oh no, there's no bus, right? I would look for an alternative. So these kind of adaptations can be made in the moment. So I might call the bus company, right? So I might call if there's a help number, depending on what the bus system is. Um, I might talk to somebody else who's in line to see what's going on or if they know or if there's an alternative form of transportation that they know about or they're doing. Okay, Tommy, somebody talking about, the, okay, the weather, Joel, could be an unexpected situation. Absolutely, if somebody doesn't have an umbrella and they're waiting in line and they get soaked, Tommy, um, somebody talking about drugs on the, yeah, so they could overhear somebody talking about drugs, which could be triggering. This often happens. Absolutely. And so, yeah, thinking about coping skills. So these are all things to think about. If, for example, you're going with somebody while they're on the bus and something comes up, that's like a teachable moment to use to say, okay, well, we've talked about coping skills before. What's a coping skill you could use now? Or in the example of weather, what people could do if there's unexpected weather or to do planning in case of weather, Like right? This is why it's good to look in advance of what the weather is gonna be just in case, because there aren't always bus shelters when you're waiting. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask if anyone has an example of doing for versus doing with a client. What is something that you do or teach where you could do for somebody versus do with somebody in the case of supported employment or supportive housing? Because this is feedback that we get um, that there's a lot of pressure, especially during COVID-19, to just do for people. Mm -hmm. So Tammy, going grocery shopping versus teaching them to grocery shop. Absolutely. So going grocery shopping. So if you drive somebody to go grocery shopping, you're doing that for them. What happens if you're away and the next person who works with them doesn't want to go, um, doesn't want to go grocery shopping with them? They don't have the skill to do it themselves, right? Or they end up leaving the program. They don't have the skill to do that. So Tommy, filling out applications for people. Absolutely, right? They're not going to learn how to do that. And why people do it, it's slow, right, for somebody to fill out the application themselves. So it's quicker for you to do it, but then you'll have to do it forever because they won't know how to do it. Um, we've got a lot of examples here, sorry. Um, looking for an apartment. Again, if you're doing all the searching, they don't learn any skills um, to, to search instead of making phone calls for the client. Be with the client while they make the call, absolutely. Muriel, that's a great point. Doing all the phone calls for appointments, the same thing, Patricia, absolutely. And again, that's an issue of time, right? 
it's a lot longer to prep somebody to make those calls, to have to ask them the questions, to have them write things down. The phone call itself is going to take longer, absolutely. To walk alongside them, to support them as they're doing, giving them the opportunity to do themselves, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of examples of making calls for consumers versus letting the consumers do the calls, right? And that is going to take a lot of prep with the consumer to help them get ready for the call. I know if there's a call I'm nervous about, I write everything down to prep, have the number. Sometimes I write my own information because if I get nervous, it's important. So like these are all things, skills that clients can learn to. Um, helping someone to uh, develop skills for anxiety or mental health disorders so they can manage themselves, be reliant. Um, Thomas, yeah, uh, you can do that as well. Um, Melanie, I've gone grocery shopping with families, but sometimes I feel they were judging their choices. Just shopping with families, but sometimes they feel we are judging their choices of what they're buying and they're embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, Melanie, that like people might feel sensitive about what they're buying if like, you know, there's things people might, might want privacy in terms of and kind of being there all the time. That's something to talk to someone about to get a sense of, you know, do you want some privacy doing certain shopping, you know? Um, are there certain things I can help you with but things you want privacy during? So that's a, that's an important that's an important point. So Emily, your point, we can't let people touch our computers, so we have to fill out applications. Yeah, COVID-19 is making it really hard if people don't have access to public libraries or their own computers. Online applications kind of need to be done um, by, um, by you in a lot of cases um, because of issues of social distancing um, and that is making it hard to do with. Um, so that's just a little bit about thinking about the type of interventions um, that should be going on plans and the focus um, of a lot of work, right? Restoring functioning, doing with, and using teachable moments in the environment. Because, you know, if you don't prepare people with buses and public transit, they could be absolutely left or with grocery shopping or um, applications, you know, services end, they work with another worker um, who doesn't do these things for them. It could really be a, it could really be a problem down the line. So for um, FCS interventions, again, supported employment and supportive housing, um, there are different types of services that you'll be providing, and I'll just give you a list on the next slide of both. So for um, supportive um, housing, there's pre and post tenancy skills and resources. For supportive employment, there's job search and sustaining skills and resources, and then in general, ADLs um, and resources in both those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Angela, especially having to connect from home. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're calling people, that type of thing. It's, it's harder to do with um, in these circumstances. Definitely more of a challenge. So these are the types of services that are being provided. Again, I'll give you a list in a moment. And the methods of acquiring skills and resources um, are using EBT. So once you know what you're providing for a service, if, for example, it's filling out um, or, you know, a goal to submit three um, housing applications in the next three months, um, how are you going to support someone to do that? Is it, you know, skills to fill out the application? Is it communication skills to get the application, to ask people about it, to do the interviews, you know, the methods of how you're going to teach? And so the examples we have here, we're going to focus a lot, as I mentioned, on skills teaching. There's also motivational enhancements, cognitive behavioral techniques, and illness management and recovery. Oh, tell, show, do is new angel. Yeah, that's a specific way of talking about it. It's a frame, it's an evidence-based practice for talking about skills teaching. We're actually going to go over that in a moment. Um, it might be very similar to what you do. It's one specific way of talking about it. There's not just kind of one way to do skills teaching, but this is what we use um, when we do skills teaching. It was included in um, the state plan amendment. So um, our kind of outline from Medicaid of supportive housing, but I'll go through that in a moment, so. So supported, Um, so employment, um, supported employment services. So pre-employment services, 
person-centered employment planning, benefits, education and planning, and then employment sustaining services. These are just lists. Again, this comes from the healthcare authority. This is outlined um, in your agreement with Medicaid of what supported employment is. Um, and so what is a common, for those of you who, um, who provide supported employment services, what's a common supportive employment service that you provide? Is there one that's like, oh, this is on every plan? We get a lot here budgeting. <laughs> that that is a very common um, service that's provided. Um, but is there anything in supportive employment that you feel like is a common, um, a common service? Okay, well, I'm going to keep moving because we're a little bit behind um, because I was kicked off, but um, creating a resume. Okay, yeah, that's a great example. So that is something and right that might be knowledge, skills or resources um, in terms of it needs to be printed if you need to access a computer, right? So lots of different things that can go into that. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and from Tammy, referrals to work source, employment, education, training. So again, resources. Those are great examples. Thank you. And so for supportive housing, you have pre-tenancy and post-tenancy. And think about what a common supportive housing service you might provide as well. Um, so these are the types of services um, that are outlined under um, the state regulations that are provided in supportive housing and supported employment. Um, under the umbrella program FCS. So thinking about how you provide that service is thinking about FCS, support, again, supported employment, supportive housing methods, includes skills teaching, which most of you say that you do. And I'm gonna talk about the method tell, show, do, and again, provide a template for skills teaching. There's resource acquisition, this is about sharing and connecting people to resources, then motivational enhancement strategies, cognitive behavioral techniques, illness management recovery. Again, we're gonna go through all of this and I'm gonna give you examples and resources. Um, so we're gonna focus the rest of the time on these methods of providing interventions. So tell, show, do, again, is an evidence-based practice to do skills teaching. And the idea is, again, most of you say that you teach skills, but this is, again, a method to, to, that is quite methodological in terms of every time you teach a skill, you're supposed to do these eight steps. Um, and the idea is that people learn the skills faster and they're more likely to become proficient in them and keep them overall and generalize them in their lives using these steps than just kind of teaching ad hoc. Um, so, um, these eight steps, part of them are telling someone, part of them are showing a skill, and then part of them is the actual client doing the skill. So the first step is to establish the rationale for the skill. And so the idea is why is it important for someone to be learning this? What importance does it have in their lives? How will they apply it? Because it might not be entirely clear to the person. And this is what goes to motivation, that if somebody knows what the skill is um, and how they'll use it, it, they might be more motivated to, to work on it. The second is to discuss and break down the steps of the skill. We're gonna focus on this quite a bit. Um, and the idea is that they should have a list of exactly written, it could be in a video, but just somewhere, a list that's consistent of what the skills are. And so these first two steps, you're telling someone the rationale and the steps. The third step is to model the skill using the steps. And so there should be some type of demonstration. It doesn't necessarily have to be you. It could be a video demonstration, but something where the person um, sees the skill modeled to get a sense of what it is. And then the last, um, the next step is asking the person to try the skill out. This can be in a role play. Um, this could be in a natural environment, but this is where the person is actually gonna try to use the skill. Then you're gonna provide feedback to the person. Oh, well, you did this very well, but you forgot to, you know, 
put in the laundry detergent if someone's learning to use laundry, right? So thinking about um, positive and corrective feedback, then if needed, the skill should be asked to be done again and additional feedback if necessary, and then encourage practice in a natural environment on their own without your support. So this would be homework. So when we're giving you learning applications, we're asking you to practice in a natural environment the concepts that we're teaching you or um, rehashing for those of you who already know them. So again, steps one and two are telling, step three is showing, and then the additional steps is the person doing. Um, so just as a question, when you're teaching, do you do all of these steps? Just as a question, do you, for every skill that you teach or do you use some of them? And if you do, what, what steps do you, are you most likely to use? Okay, Tommy, right now it's hard to do because of COVID-19. Absolutely. There are some skills that are easier to do over the phone, but yeah, it's really hard to model if the person doesn't have a smartphone or access to the internet. It can be really hard to send a video or to email stats. Um, very, very hard, absolutely, to do that safely. That's an excellent point. Um, but let's say in a non-COVID, pre-COVID, for those of you who did this work, pre-COVID. Okay. Joel, that's wonderful to hear. So yes, most clients, but not the additional feedback all the time. Okay. So, but going through those steps, so giving homework and all the other steps, that's great to hear. So Tommy, we do conference calls with landlords to model this, um, this, this skill. Okay, that's wonderful. Modeling communication skills um, by having a conference call. That's a great use of technology. So thinking about, do you do all these steps? So the reason we're going through this is because these steps are really important. And in skills teaching, I'm sure like some of them modeling, asking the person to try, um, those are focused on, but other things like homework might not be as focused or um, the feedback component. And so we're talking about this as a kind of a, a total method because it's so important to do all of these. So with my line of work, I develop the coordination of care and the peer case manager do the steps to encourage the participant to complete their goals. Okay, so it's broken up who writes the intervention versus who actually performs them. Okay, so Tina, I have a client coming in to fill out paperwork for an order of dissemination because she's so overwhelmed and puts it to the side. So we will fill it out, call the schedule, the hearing. Okay, so going through, you're doing that work with her. Okay, so that definitely sounds like it's some of the, you're gonna be doing some modeling. Um, she might do some of the practicing. Okay. Joel, homework is a major focus in our program and we usually have to detail. Yeah, so Joel, so your program focuses on homework. Homework is really important. And I, have, I found with like college students, homework is really important because people are just so busy, have so much going on, and if it isn't kind of integrated into people's lives, if they haven't used it themselves, figuring out if it makes sense to them, a lot of the information can be lost. And so the fact of checking the homework. So if you guys have noticed, each week we checked the learning application we give you. Because the idea is, if we talk about SMART last week and never bring it up again, you know, I'll, we'll never give you an opportunity to reflectively think back and think, did I use that? Are the things I'm looking at SMART? Some of you may do that naturally, have been already familiar with SMART. For, for, for those of you that SMART was new, having that opportunity to reflect back is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Joel. So Emily, I have clients write appeal letters. I break down why we do this, break down the format, provide examples. Um, I ask them to write a letter, review their letter, provide edits. That's wonderful, the back and forth process you're talking about in terms of feedback, having them write it, giving them, and again, Emily, that's really a long process, right, of going back and forth, but they're gonna get a lot out of that. And the reason why sometimes people do things for is they, you know, people are busy. There's sometimes not time. The person is kind of used to people um, having them write the letter, um, but that's a wonderful um, back and forth um, with the editing process. That sounds like a really good, um, a really good back and forth. So because we're talking about these different steps being important, 
um, we're providing a resource of these steps, um, which is called a skills teaching template. Has anybody used a skills teaching template before? Um, nope. So this is just an example. Again, this is going to be in box in our system. So you should be able to sit, download and save this. Um, and what this is, is it's a way for you, you, for other staff to do planning. And so this is an opportunity to think about what, what's the skill you're teaching? What's the rationale? What are you going to talk to people? Why are you teaching someone this skill? How does it relate to their goal? How are you going to teach it to them? What are the steps involved, right? What are some role plays you could do with them? you know, remembering to do homework. So this is breaking down tell, show, do into places where you can pre-plan. So if you have some time before you're meeting with somebody, you can get ideas down. It's an opportunity for you, for other staff to be able to do some planning. So the way that it's broken down is first you think about orienting to the skill. Okay, so Emily, you're having some difficulty. So um, send me your email um, privately and I'll email it to you afterwards. Okay. You know what I'm gonna do since other people need it? I'm gonna give you guys my email. All right, so for those of you who need it, um, email, you can email me asking for the skills template. Um, I probably won't be able to do it. I might be able to do it during the breakout group, actually, if I have time, but you can email me for it. Somebody did last week asking for something, so I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. So Tommy, Emily. So, the, so for those of you who can see the template, um, and Tommy and Emily, I'm going to be going over this, so you should be able to... Um, um, you should be able to follow along even without being able to look at it right now. So it starts with an orientation to the skill, what's being taught, why is the skill being taught. Oh, <laughs> Tina, I can't send the, the presentation. That's all, that would be too, too much for everyone. I am going to follow up with the Washington State Healthcare Authority absolutely today. Um, so this is just about the template. I'm not sending out the videos or the presentations because that's all going officially out through HCA. We don't have control over that. This is just for the template. I'm really sorry. I would love to send everything to you, but it's just not, um, it's just not possible for everyone to independently email me. I'm sorry. Um, it's just kind of our, our relationship with them, but for the template, absolutely. Um, so orienting to the skill, thinking about how you want to talk about the rationale, and then the steps of the skill. This is really important to have a standard step for the skill because week to week, month to month, you might not remember what the steps are. You might be out one week and having a, a, a somewhere where the steps are written down could be really important if somebody's replacing you, you're out on vacation or out sick and there's work being done with a client, so staying consistent is really important. Um, then demonstrating the skill, right? How do you plan on demonstrating the skill? Uh, maybe having a video, something like that. So thinking about that in advance and then practice, um, the, practice the skill. So think about what role plays you might use, what real life situations. Um, oh, Patricia, I'm so glad you were able to, to get it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the link one more time. Um, and Patricia suggests putting it in, um, in a new link. So again, that's the skills template. So, so do, for those of you who have looked at it, do you feel like it might be helpful um, to be able to use this um, in terms of planning to do skills teaching or to share with other staff? Um, again, this is just a way to have some thought in advance to stay consistent on steps, um, to do some planning. Um, is this might might this be something that could be useful? Take a moment, take a look. Okay. 
it is very user friendly. That's the goal, Patricia, absolutely. Um, and the goal is, again, this is for internal use. Um, and it's just, you know, you can have these as resources to think about because maybe there's a skill you teach a lot and you can go back to it, right? So you can make these kind of four different skills and keep them, you know, alphabetically in a file or do them electronically and keep them in a, a file. So this is a great way to, to not start from scratch when you're working with somebody to have these written down. Um, yeah, so Emily, email me like I suggested. Um, I'm happy to email it to you. So now I'm gonna demonstrate a skill um, to talk about skill demonstration and the importance of it. I have plastic gloves here because I'm gonna demonstrate how to safely take off medical gloves. And so thinking about why this might be important right now, um, a lot of people because of COVID-19, um, especially people um, who have um, underlying health conditions that make them more susceptible um, to kind of serious reactions and perhaps um, are more likely to need ventilators and other things. Um, having gloves to protect people, um, to protect oneself um, when in public places can be really important. And so safely taking off medical gloves is important because the gloves are protecting you from getting different toxins, viruses, um, spores from COVID-19 on your skin, right? And so taking them safely off is almost as important as having them on. Otherwise, it can get on your skin, which can get in your eyes. So that was just talking about the rationale for why it might be important right now. So that's something that's important to start with. So then I have identified steps. This actually comes from the CDC, so I didn't come up with this list. For certain things like medical things, it might be a really good idea to get an established list so that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and so following the steps to demonstrate, so what I would start by doing is grasping the outside of the glove at the risk, not touching my bare skin. The idea is the outside of the gloves are dirty, and so I never want the outside of the gloves to touch my bare skin, although I just touched my chin, but ignore that. It's just for the purposes of, a, I'm in a tight space. So I'm gonna pull this off away from my body inside out. So this other glove never touched my skin. Then I'm gonna hold the glove in the hand, in my gloved hand. Now I'm gonna peel the second glove off by putting my bare skin on the inside of the glove never touching the outside because again my bare skin should never touch the outside of the glove so i'm peeling this second glove turning it inside out while pulling it away from my body so now all i'm touching is the outside the inside of the gloves not the outside then i'm going to dispose of these gloves and clean my hands immediately so in terms of demonstrating this skill what are some things I did to demonstrate this skill that are maybe in keeping with um, some things that I just spoke about? I talked about what I was doing while I did it. I visually showed you, right? I made sure to have gloves here. step-by-step -step model. I spoke through each step as I did it. Yeah, and I reiterated, and this actually wasn't in the steps, the inside outside of the glove, the difference between inside and outside, I thought that was important. And that might be just not in the steps, right? Because somebody might be not realizing the difference between the inside and the outside being clean and your skin only touching the inside and never touching the outside. Mm -hmm. So talking through rationale is really important, absolutely. And yeah, having some type of aid is really helpful because otherwise I'm just kind of talking about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what we're going to do now is use breakout groups, but I'd like to point out if it doesn't work, just write the steps down yourself. So what I want you to do is because writing down the steps, I gave you the steps for taking a glove off is really important. This is really key to the beginning, to the telling part of teaching. And so what I'm gonna do is ask you for, let's say four minutes, super, super brief, to write down all of the steps to washing your hands, okay? Again, if the breakout groups don't work out, if you don't have audio, write the steps down yourself. 
absolutely fine, okay? And what I want you to think about are what are points that are difficult or contentious in writing down the steps if you're doing it in a group or things that are difficult for you um, if you're doing it on your own, okay? So any questions before we move into breakout groups? I know some people don't like them, some people really like them. Um, oh no. What's happening? I don't have an option to do breakout groups. It's a lie. Um, we have a longer amount of time. Yeah, okay, so there's not going to be a breakout group. You're going to do it individually. So talk about adapting on the fly. So I'm just going to give you guys five minutes to write the steps down yourself. So, you know, type in your computer, write on a piece of paper all the steps to wash your hands. And then if some of you type it and want to paste it in, you absolutely can. Um, and think about how many steps. It's you have to wash your hands, okay? So take five minutes. Everybody, you can write on a pad of paper. You can type it on a document in your computer. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to email the people the template who, um, who asked me for it. So um, again, um, about five minutes. So I'm gonna check in with you in four minutes to see how people are doing, okay? So till about um, 10.42, okay? So 10.42. So take a couple minutes. No, Joel, that's absolutely fine. So I'm gonna ask you to write more specific. This is if you're actually teaching somebody who doesn't know how to wash their hands. No, it's totally fine. So again, you're doing this as if you're teaching somebody who doesn't know how to properly wash their hands. So you're gonna have some in-depth um, instructions. I wasn't gonna give you that, but I will now. Okay, so I already have a short one from Joel, then we've got from Kelly, we've got nine steps. Great. And Lance as well, turn the water put soap on your hands, so a little bit more description, scrub hands for 30 seconds. Okay, using the ABC song, that was some of the directives the, uh, the CDC gave. And soap, dry hands, paper towel to turn water, throw paper towel and garbage. So I'll just ask for those of you who are, um, so when you're home, do you, oh, turn on the water to the desired temperature, that's different, okay. So for those of you who are writing to use a paper towel, do you do that when you're home? Like in your own private bathroom? Yes, okay, Kelly. Turn on the hot water, put a little water to make the water warm, put your hand over the soap dispenser, push. Okay, so Tina, very detailed quarters. 
your, the amount of soap, rub hands together, making sure you're touching, rubbing every part of your hands. Okay, very detailed. Dry both hands, turn off the paper towel. Okay, yeah, that's very detailed, Tina. Wow. Tina, have you taught that skill before? I like the amount of, the, the amount of detail was really wonderful in terms of how to rub, right? Because what if someone's just like, oh, I rubbed my hands, right? So kind of being more specific about surfaces, really nice level of detail. So in thinking about this, right, it's sometimes hard to know the level of detail that somebody needs. And this is kind of the, the question about knowing the person you're teaching, right? Because if somebody, because you're not in the bathroom with somebody necessarily when they're washing their hands, right? Especially if they're not um, the same sex as the person. Um, so thinking about, right, how much detail someone needs, because it's possible, you know, people are washing their hands, but their hands are still dirty, right? Because what's happening? Um, so the steps that they have and what they think they should do is not actually what's going on. And so that's why the steps are so important. Okay, so we've got Emily, turn the knob, check the temperature. I think checking the temperature is really, and I actually didn't even think about checking the temperature. Yeah, you could have scolding, uh, scolding water or water that's too cold. Uh, check the soap, if bar. Okay, so I like that also, Emily, between bar versus liquid, right? It depends if they're, if they're in someone's apartment using you know, a bar, like maybe they don't know how to use a bar. Absolutely. Sabrina, yes, there are excellent videos. So that's also a resource, especially if somebody has the ability with a smartphone or a computer to be able to refer back to, because you're gonna to wanna to give them something they can refer back to. But yeah, absolutely having videos. Oh, contrasting paint cover colors. Oh, I love that, Angela. Yeah, to see what's on the outside. You could probably do that with like chalk dust or something as well, or like rock climbing dust, you know. Chalk, yeah, chalk dust, basically, to see if you're getting any on your actual skin. That's an excellent, excellent recommendation. But yeah, so everybody's doing different things, right? Telling between, you know, so differences. So what are some of the differences that you're seeing in how people broke down the steps? And thank you so much, for those of you who are sharing ideas of places to go for resources. It's wonderful to, to share those type of things. So what are some differences in the way people are breaking steps down that you're noticing? Thank all of you for, um, for sharing, again, resources and also steps. Okay, Joel, some more specific amount of time to rub hands together, right? Which has been some of the directives from the CDC because some people, right, wash their hands too quickly. Um, Okay, so Lance, you noticed some people had more detail on their list than your list, which again, depending on the person and the situation and the skill, it depends on what the skill is, right? Do people need that amount of detail? Dennis, you tried the ABC thing. Yeah, and some people are saying to do the ABCs twice, <laughs> to sing the ABCs twice as the amount of time to, to do hand washing. Yeah, that's a great way um, to give people, an, instead of saying do for 30 seconds, like have people actually do the song is a good way to, to teach the skill. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other differences? Paper towel versus towel, liquid versus bar. I think having those built in because you're not sure and the skill might need to be used in different environments. So maybe at home it's a bar soap versus in public it's liquid. So preparing people for those differences. So th those were things that I didn't think about, right? And in fact, in what I'm about to show you, it also didn't think about, was not included. So these are steps of skills from the CDC and the National Health Service, um, which one has five, one has 11. They break things down very differently. Neither distinguish between liquid or bar soap, I'd like to point out. Nobody, the CDC talks about warm versus cold. The National Health Service from Britain doesn't. Um, 
the language used, scrub versus rub. The CDC talks about lathering. The, N um, the National Health Service doesn't talk about lathering. The National Health Service talks about a disposable towel um, to turn off the tap. The CDC doesn't, right? And so thinking about the differences in the way that you did skills um, versus um, versus these different things. First of all, there are resources, right? The CDC has videos. Has I got that as a, on a as a list from the CDC. Joel, the happy birthday. That's new to you. Yeah, there's all these different resources, but making sure you pick something that's going to work for the person, right? Do they have liquid or um, bar soap? Do they know what lathering means, right? Do they have an amount of time? Like including that level of detail might be really important for somebody learning and using a skill properly, like hand washing, which is really important, not just now, but always. Um, so there's some things to remember when you're teaching a skill. It's hard to break down overlearned skills, right? So something like hand washing you do every day is overlearned. It's automatic, it's natural, and honestly, I think the example, Joel, that you gave of just writing quickly the steps, that's something that's like, yeah, I do this every day. I don't need to think about how long I'm doing it. I was taught it. I know it. And so thinking about the fact that people that you're working with didn't learn or didn't learn these skills fully um, in childhood, adolescence, or early adulthood when many people do. And so these things are not natural to them. And so the way you initially break them down may not be sufficient for the people that you're working with. Does that make sense? So you're thinking about how to teach them in a way with somebody who doesn't know the skill to be able to understand them. And that is going to require a lot of detail for some people. Yeah, so Melanie, thinking about what happens when you run out of soap, right? Is, are there other things you can use, right? Like shampoo or I would think like body wash or something might work if they have some of that. Yeah, so thinking about problem solving, right? Where to get more, what if they run out? These are great things to include when you're teaching the skill, absolutely. So one thing is detail because it's hard to break over learned skills. It's also how you perform the skill depends on the context you're using it in. So thinking about are you teaching people to use a bathroom, their own individual bathroom at home? or a public restroom. And that's going to matter in terms of what type of soap, in terms of is it paper towels or towels, right? All those things are important when you're teaching a skill, thinking about how it's going to actually be used and what are things to think about in different contexts. Another is that everyone does things a little bit differently. So you want to stay consistent when you're teaching. That's with a written list or a shared clip. And so, for example, that's why I share the skills teaching template, but that's a way to get on the same page. Um, so any questions about skills teaching? I've taken a little bit longer than I intended to, but hopefully it was helpful um, to go through this in a little bit because again, 85% of you said that you did skills teaching and so I thought that this would be important to, uh, important to go over. So resource acquisition is something else to think about and I just put down a list here of thinking about what's available in your community and how do you find that out? Right, what are sources you go to and how do you find out what's going on? And that's a good thing to share with the people that you're working with, right? Where do you go to? Is there a calendar? Is there a number to call? Um, right, how do you find out what's going on? And then sharing that information with colleagues, right? Do any other agencies have like lists of resources? I know that's pretty common. How does that get updated, right? That's a good way so that more than just you know about that resource. Um, also looking for natural supports, right? So your agency is not a natural support. It's an extra support for your clients. But what are supports that exist in the community? So instead of driving somebody to an appointment, right? What are natural supports, for example, a disability, um, a disability um, ride service, like I mentioned in New York City, there's Access a Ride. You know, those are resources that your agency isn't required for. Another thing is to um, consider preferences and needs. It was mentioned earlier that someone was afraid to use an elevator. That's really important, right? They can't live on the 15th floor of an elevator building, right? If they have a phobia. So that's really important to think about, like what are things that are important to the person? People don't have choices for everything, but keeping people's preferences for certain things is really important because they might not be able to live in an apartment if they're deathly afraid of right, of elevators, and it's too high for them to walk. 
also involve the person in finding or accessing resources. Okay, so we've got, we keep it in our, in our team's age. Okay, so that sounds like it's an online source for references. So Melanie, your colleague, Cody Taylor, created a resource book we give our clients when we bring them to our program. Okay, so that's shared with folks. That's wonderful. Um, and Melanie, can that be updated when there's new resources? Because that's a huge problem with resource lists. They get old, they just close, numbers change, contacts change. And so thinking about how those resources are updated. So what's, so thinking about that, thank you both for sharing. So what's a common, oh, you update them often, that's wonderful. So what's a common resource that people need that you found with your programs that people are just asking about a lot? Housing lists or places that are hiring, absolutely. So open apartments, open jobs, yeah. Anything else? That does sound like it would be a frequent <laughs> a thing that people would need in support of housing. Um, meals, okay, Department of Vocational Rehab, bus passes, SSI, places for family or individual therapists, absolutely, probably who accept Medicaid, I would imagine. Social security card, absolutely, especially for people who have perhaps been chronically homeless and don't have um, updated forms of ID. So social security card, SSI, so that's another resource. Yeah, so these are things that are commonly looked for a lot of these are entitlements um state cell phones absolutely um so resource acquisition is important and it sounds like some of your agencies have really good ways of collecting keeping resources and that's what I'm going to say, like thinking about like skills teaching is also a place to, to kind of collect and organize um, when somebody has, for example, a really good way of explaining something that's a common skill, it might be nice to keep something similar in terms of a list of skills and role plays um, so that you're not recreating the real for skills that are taught commonly, mm -hmm. just to think about. Okay, I'm losing a lot of people. So now I'm going to quickly go through um, motivational enhancements, um, laundry and shower facilities. Absolutely. And that's going to be neighborhood de specific, depending on where the people live. Um, so motivational enhancement comes from motivational interviewing, which was developed in the 1980s um, by folks working in, um, in addiction services, in the field of addictions. And the idea is that with changes, when people are contemplating making changes, they're often ambivalent about it. So in the case of, for example, stopping smoking, right, smoking is highly addictive, but for people that are contemplating stopping, it's important to get people um, to, to kind of wrestle with their own ambivalence about it and to get to a point where they're motivated and that motivation, internal motivation, is how you achieve lasting change. So it's not somebody saying, hey, smoking is bad for you, but it's somebody exploring their own reasons why they're smoking um, and why they'd like to stop smoking and coming to the place where they want to stop. And it's not externally, but it's people internally taking information and exploring that ambivalence. And so in thinking about what is a, a change that people are often ambivalent about making? I gave the example of smoking, but something that is perhaps unhealthy that people are doing, but it's hard and people say they want to do, but um, it's hard for them to do. A GED, Angela, that's an excellent, that's an excellent example. Yeah, I want to go back to school. I want to finish my GED. Communication, absolutely. I suffer from that. Exercise routine. Oh, I want to exercise, but oh, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want, right? So exercise routine, losing weight, right? They, it's, you know, it's important. Um, but, you know, struggling. So people show ambivalence, right? They want to do these things, but keep doing these sustaining behaviors and don't change. And so motivational enhancements, um, I'm going to give you a couple examples, are working to work with that ambivalence to get people to the point, if they are going to get to the point of stopping those behaviors or getting a GED. 
um, or budgeting better or having an exercise routine, right? Or losing weight. And so, so for example, identifying change talk, and I'm gonna use the example of smoking cessation. So if, for example, you're having a conversation pointing out when that person is talking about things about changing smoking. So looking for those words, those examples the person's using and try to pull that out and have people talk about that. So identify that as you're working with somebody. Um, that's something that you can do. Also exploring pros and cons of smoking. So some people use decisional matrix matrices um, or pro-con lists. It depends on what you're comfortable working with, but thinking about how to go through decisional balance scales. Yes, Joel, absolutely. Um, so thinking about that kind of weighing cost and, and benefit of smoking, right? Because as much as they may want to not smoke, the smoking is doing something for them, right? It might be social, it might be in terms of um, anxiety, it might be getting a break at work, but whatever it is, it might be doing something for the person and having them acknowledge what that is is important for thinking about them getting to the point of wanting to make the change. And then also using open-ended questions and affirmations to re reinforce smoking reduction. So for example, if somebody mentions they smoked fewer cigarettes last week, asking them about it, right? Tell me more, you mentioned last week what was going on, right? You know, oh, you mentioned you were less stressed. Does this, you know, like exploring that and affirming, oh, that's, you know, that's great. You said you wanted to smoke less, you had a reduction. So those kind of tell me more about using affirmations to kind of support the changed behavior. So um, we're not gonna go through this too. I'm, I spent a little bit too much time on the skills teaching, so we're going to go through this pretty quickly. But so for an FCS client who's ambivalent about preparing for an apartment interview, what's an open ended question you could ask? So a client that's preparing for an interview, um, but um, but is but is nervous about it, not sure they want to go. Um, is, you know, what's yeah, I'm not going to get the job anyways, but I should go. What's a question you could ask them to try to support, um, to kind of figure out what's going on? Okay, Angela, what questions are you nervous about, right? The person's a little nervous about the interview. What, what's making you nervous, right? Maybe you can prep for those things if you're nervous about them, okay. Tell me about your anxiety around the interview. What are you worried about? Yeah, getting to like what this is, naming it, and then kind of working through it. Is it about getting questions? Yeah, so maybe it's something in their background. Maybe they had a horrible experience at a job interview last year, right? Um, and so maybe it's about learning more about the interview they're going to go to to feel more comfortable, right? And making sure that what they're worried about isn't going to happen or preparing them if it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the idea that like these ambivalences are something that people that are important and that it might tell you about their background, it might tell them something that happened to them in the past, it might tell you about their current anxieties, um, and that these things are valid and that they need to work through them. So you're trying to get somebody to think about their ambivalence to get to a point um, that they're um, okay. So Kelly, maybe it's going to the interview with them and being present if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Tammy, what's your experience with past interviews? Yeah, just trying to get a little bit more information about what it is about the interview that's bringing up this anxiety. What are they really worried about? Another type method of, of services on um, ISPs are cognitive behavioral techniques, which comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, rehabilitation is not therapy, so this is not cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's cognitive behavioral techniques. Both are T's, so it's sometimes a little confusing, um, especially for people who have therapeutic backgrounds and may provide or have provided um, cognitive behavioral therapy in the past or presently. Um, so these are techniques and strategies to basically change behavior and change thoughts, so behavior modification and cognitive restructuring, with the idea that sometimes people have unhealthy or unproductive thoughts and behaviors, right? So certain types of spending behaviors, certain types of eating behaviors might be unhealthy, right? Get people into debt, perhaps are unhealthy to the eating to the point of somebody's binge eating to the point of being sick. These are things that are like unhealthy for the person. And if somebody is in the place where they want to stop these behaviors, that's where you would use CBT. 
but it requires that the person is motivated to make the change already. So they're not ambivalent, but they want to stop spending or they want to stop binge eating. And that's something that they're committed to. We're going to talk about this with stages of change um, in, a, in a moment. So you've got changing thoughts and changing behaviors. And so examples of CBT, and this is for the example of around getting a new apartment, you might use role play. So we talked about role play with skills teaching, but this might be using deep breaths and positive self-talk to cope with the stress after uh, not getting an apartment. So this could be a situation where somebody doesn't get an apartment, they could kind of spiral with anxiety, with anger. And so the question is, how do you use breath and self-talk, perhaps um, repeated statements and that type of thing in order to prepare people? Because people sometimes don't get jobs and don't get apartments and learning some of those behaviors that can sh help structure people's thoughts and behaviors. So if there's a specific behavior, for example, you know, breaking things or, for example, spiraling into binge eating and you want to change those behaviors, then role-playing preparation to, to change your thoughts to help you have different behaviors, that's a way you can use CBT. And if anyone has any questions about these, these are just examples. This is not a training on CBT or motivational enhancement. These are just examples of things that could be done on ISP. Also modeling is something else that can be used. So for example, identifying negative thought patterns after moving into a new apartment by using a thought record worksheet. So for example, if somebody moves into a new apartment, they maybe haven't lived in an apartment by themselves independently um, and they're really anxious about it, right? But they're about to move into an apartment. So you could model, right? Moving into perhaps in a role play where you demonstrate the way some thoughts that might come up and demonstrate how to use a physical thought record. So that's something you could do. Um, and then reinforcing through positive affirmation steps towards achieving a goal like fi of finding a new apartment. So for example, if somebody's looking to find and move into a new apartment, if somebody, for example, gets an application and fills it out by themselves, that's a step towards finding a new apartment. And by affirming that, you're reinforcing those behaviors to get more and fill out more applications. And so reinforcement of behaviors that are considered productive and healthy are part of the ways in which cognitive behavioral techniques work. And so for a client who needs to ask an employer for an accommodation, what's an example of modeling you could do? How could you model if somebody wants to um, ask an employer for an accommodation? How could you model um, similar, um, what type of situation? How could you model that? doing a role play, right? So role playing a situation and you could pick a specific accommodation, maybe not the accommodation that the person needs. Thank you, Lance. So you could role play, what's a type of accommodation you could role play asking for? A support animal, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important one. A lot of people and more and more people emotional support animals. Or for example, for somebody who's blind or visually impaired, a support animal. Flexibility with start time. Mm -hmm. Oh, so maybe needing to start a little bit later if they're taking their meds in the morning. Mm -hmm. Lance, that's a great example. Yeah, so thinking about the different types of things you can model, and that's why, again, the skills teaching template can be really helpful to think about these models in advance. So illness management and recovery, um, it's a large area, but it's about helping people to manage and recover from their illnesses. It could be mental illness or substance use disorder. Um, there is the SAMHSA toolkit of IMR, um, has anybody used that toolkit before? Um, I'm 
pasting it here. So this is basically um, a guide to helping people recover from a serious mental illness. Um, and so it starts with recovery, it's information about mental illnesses, thinking about a re recovery planning. Um, and so this has broken down into worksheets, information, so it really helps with people, perhaps if you don't have so much experience with a serious mental illness um, and talk about side effects um, and symptoms of the illness. So this is great for background information. Has anyone used this before? Is this a new resource? So this is a great tool um, that's provided um, for free or it can be customized for different states or agencies um, to help um, with some resources for education and also some activities. MI activity, motivational activities, um, CBT activities, so learning different skills. Um, so have folks used it before? Lance, you haven't. So I suggest, um, so I put the link again. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so if folks are able to click on the link, it's over 200 pages. It's a big resource. Um, we're not going to go through it, but um, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It's, it's got a lot of great information. Um, our, our state psychiatric hospital system uses it quite a bit. So some people may be in your in psychiatric hospitals have used some of it. Um, but um, it can be a really good resource um, for information. Um, okay, so Joel is talking about using a CBT technique of reframing um, the same thought using um, two triangles. Um, so that's a wonderful to share, Joel. That's a great, um, a great way to use CBT. Um, and Kelly bringing up the question between emotional support versus a service animal, for example, a seeing eye dog for somebody who's blind or visually impaired. That probably depends on the state, the housing complex. It really is dependent, so it's definitely something to look into. Um, and also for public accommodations, do people have the right to have emotional support animals? Um, so that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up, Kelly. Um, so for IMR, there's that toolkit that I sent. So hopefully you're taking, you know, save the link um, and it's great to go through. Um, the illness management recovery includes education about mental illness or medication, a relapse recovery plan, medication management skills, for example, being able to take pills, um, helping to learn to set alarms, um, maybe using a pill box, substance use treatment strategies, all of those things are under illness management and recovery. So it could be using the, the, um, the toolkit I just sent you that has a lot of great resources and I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, but also anything around med education, med management, anything like that is going to be under IMR. So what I'm going to do is just a quick activity. No. Okay. So what I'm going to quickly ask, um, does anyone, um, if anyone has any questions about IMR, I have a feeling folks are looking at the link I just gave, but, um, for the purposes of time, we're going to kind of keep moving. But um, what I'm going to ask you to do is I have an objective up here. For the next six months, Angela will learn how to use a pill box to independently manage her medication. So this is an illness management recovery type objective. So what's an example of a motivational enhancement strategy that Angela, that, that Angela could learn and that the worker working with Angela could work on? What's a motivational enhancement? We talked about exploring, um, change talk, evaluate pros and cons of using a pill box. Absolutely, um, right? Because why is she not using one right now? Why might it be helpful for her to start using one? Um, is she taking her pills irregularly? Is she taking too many? Not enough. Um, so that's why, why use a pill box? That's a great example. Does anyone else have an example of a motivational enhancement to work on using a pill box. Anne, 
important. Oh, I see important versus confident, right? Is this an issue of skills, resources, or does she just not think it's important, right? Okay, using an ICR scale. Showing her how to use the pill box. So that is very important using the pillbox, but what would that be an example of? So that's once she's decided, so motivation is about getting somebody comfortable and doing it with her, not for her, right? Helping her and giving her some support, but not doing it. So what is, once she's decided the pillbox is important, that's when you would teach her to use it. And that's more skills teaching, okay? Open-ended questions like what have you used um, in terms of managing taking pills in the past? Absolutely, so exploring what she's done in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So Tommy, that's a great example, um, wonderful. What's something you could do that's in terms of illness management and recovery? So we just talked about that, right? Education, med management, so this is all in that area. What's a service you could provide? Um, yeah, discuss what she'd benefit from using the pill box. Um, so IMR, what might, what education might be important beyond just using the pill box? What um, illness management information could you provide to her? Right, psychoeducation on her diagnosis from the DSM, absolutely. It might not actually be the pill box, education on her mental health condition, why medication is important. Absolutely. She might not even know why she's taking the medication, right? What are symptoms to show if it's expired? Absolutely. So information about that, like where to look for expiration, what some of the issues with expiration. What about side effects? Absolutely. Side effects are really important because that might be a reason. It might not be she doesn't know how to use the pill box. It might be that she doesn't want to take the medication. So figuring out what it is that's going on and maybe doing some education, why it's important, what symptoms are, what symptoms she's had in the past, interactions with other medications she might be taking, maybe over the counter, other things being prescribed, absolutely. So these are all things that can be done under illness management. Ed education is really important in this area. And um, the IMR book, the um, toolkit that I sent you guys, that's really good with med education. What about skills teaching? So Idella had the example of how to actually use the um, use the pill box, but what's another example of um, of skills teaching? Okay, so modeling how the therapist would do this effectively. I'm not sure exactly what that means, Joel. But yeah, teaching to use the pill box, um, teaching how to get the refills, establishing a routine, oh, modeling. Okay, sorry, okay. Using a calendar. So those are all skills to learn, right? So it could be a, a calendar in their phone. Yeah, these are great examples. So, so with an objective, you can use these different, and you can think about them, right? So motivational strategies are more things that you do when someone's ambivalent. Um, also IMR, that's more education, but skills teaching is somebody wants to use the pill box, they wanna take their pills, and then you're teaching them how to use a calendar, how to use the box, right? And so this transitions us, remind you on their phone, right? Absolutely. So this takes us to the stages of change, which is a framework from, again, addictions about thinking about how not everybody has the same level of motivation for everything. And assessing that level of motivation is really important for thinking about how to provide services. And so it breaks down um, people's level of motivation into four or five areas, sometimes six. Um, but generally, there's an area of pre-contemplation. This is when somebody, and we can use the example of smoking again, when somebody is like, I like smoking, I don't want to stop smoking. They're pre-contemplation of change. They don't want to stop, right? And so the type of uh, intervention you have would be harm reduction, right? So maybe thinking about if the person is having budgetary issues around smoking, if they need support around something, but you're not really gonna get them to stop smoking at this point. They're not even contemplating it. So doing like go to a smoking secession program isn't gonna be effective because they're not even contemplating, they're not motivated to make that change. 
And so what we're doing here is thinking about how based on if you evaluate how motivated somebody is to make a change, you can determine what type of intervention to provide that might be most effective. And so it's important to think about everybody isn't going to get skills teaching for every single intervention all the time because the goal they might not be motivated to work on it and that might not even be a good goal for them to work on if they're not motivated at all because they're, they're not going to make the change in most cases the second level of um, thinking about change is contemplation or preparation and so acknowledging the need for change but being ambivalent about that change and maybe starting to make some steps so in the case of smoking, that kind of like, I, I like smoking, but I want to, I know I need to stop. I know I need to stop. Maybe looking into smoking cessation programs, but not signing up. And so in that area is when you're going to have education and motivational intervention. So think about those pro-cons, ICR, um, scales, decisional balances. That's really where that's going to happen. Um, because somebody's working through ambivalence. So again, you're not really doing skills teaching here or access to resources. The action stage of change is where somebody is ready to do a new behavior. And so in the case of smoking cessation, it might be going to a so smoking cessation group, starting a program, getting a patch, whatever that is, making a plan to cut down or stop cold turkey, whatever that is, but like you're ready to make the change. And so in that case, that's when you'd work on skills, CBT strategies, so that might be replacing some monitoring, smoke, you know, thoughts of wanting to smoke, um, thinking about um, behavioral change, reinforcing new behaviors, all of that would be during the action stage of change. Maintenance is you have the new behavior and you want to maintain it, so that would be practical supports, maybe an ongoing support group, that type of thing. So we're kind of running out of time. So I'm gonna go through things a little bit quicker, I'm sorry. Um, partially because I got kicked off and partially because I was going slowly. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster, but if anyone has any questions, please put them in the box and just have people, do you use the stages of change? Does your agency talk about them? That's something to think about as I'm going through this. Okay, Joel, you have contemplation and preparation as separate. Yeah, as I mentioned, sometimes there's five or six steps. It all depends. We collapse them in terms of thinking about intervention, but absolutely a lot of people separate them. So that's a great point, Joel. So why consider the stages of change? So people might have very different levels of motivation for different goals. So for example, somebody might be motivated and actively looking for employment. So they're like, I need to find a job. I'm ready to find a job, but expressed ambivalence towards weight loss. These might be two goals on an ISP, and they've expressed desire in their assessment to work on both. However, their motivation is very different. So you're going to want to have different interventions for these goals. So their motivation stage in talking in the assessment might clue into what type of intervention. So for the employment goal, it might be an intervention might be um, support to write a resume, which is an action stage of change and an intervention in an action stage of change. So skills teaching to teach writing a resume. But for the weight loss goal, it might be more exploring ambivalence, maybe asking open ended questions, going into kind of the history of perhaps weight gain, weight fluctuation, all those type of things. So learning about the role of eating in their lives, and that's more at the contemplation stage of change. So thinking about these stages are helpful to thinking about what goals, um, what would be effective for interventions. So during an assessment, I'm going to give you an example. During an assessment, a client reports having a problem with acquiring or collecting things in their home. So to some degree, they're hoarding items in their home, not discarding them. There's an intervention to declutter and clear out the client's bathroom and kitchen. But the client reported not having a problem with or acquiring collecting things. That's wonderful, Patricia, to, to say that you use um, the stages of change through all your treatment. That's wonderful to hear. So what might be a better intervention to match this client's current stage of change? So the client reports not having a problem acquiring or collecting things in their home or with hoarding, but there's an intervention to declutter and clear out the client's bathroom and kitchen. So that is not, the person is pre-contemplation, does not want to declutter, <laughs> but there's an intervention to declutter. That's likely to be not very effective. Think about what an intervention might be better for somebody who has acquires and holds on to things, doesn't clear out, um, what might be a better intervention for them? Oh, 
Okay, so going through each client, yeah, each item, it might be that, for example, the client wants to cook. And there might be an area in the kitchen that they want to clear off to do something specific. So that might be focusing on what's actually important to them and finding an area that they're willing to work on. Outreach, seeing what they want to do, read their barriers. Yeah, just simple outreach, evaluating what they want to keep versus, so, go, so Joel, you're saying going through, explore how decluttering can help them. Right, so this idea of decluttering and exploring items, the person might not want to go through their items, right? And some people have clinical hoarding, um, hoarding disorder, which is in the DSM-5. And so thinking about, in fact, yeah, thinking, is there an area they want to work on because there's something they want to do? So going with what they're actually motivated to do. So if they're motivated to cook and their kitchen is cluttered, how can you help them do the thing they want? Or, yeah, talking with them, exploring if they're in a place to explore ambivalence. Now, if they're really pre-contemplative, they might not even want to talk about it. But thinking about harm reduction, if there's they want to pass a safety inspection and they need to to stay in their apartment, helping them with that. So maybe budgeting, if they're spending money acquiring things, helping them with budgeting. So not really focusing on the hoarding, but maybe the intervention in your garage, I like that. Right, so thinking about the fact that somebody might not want to go through their items, so it might be easier to not focus on hoarding, but focusing on budgeting or cooking. Does that make sense? So if somebody's really pre-contemplative, it's just not the right thing. You might want to refocus um, the goals to focus on something they actually want to work on. Because this is where you get ambivalence, where it's hard to work on things. And so interventions at the correct stage of change are matched to people's um, motivation and individuals are more willing to take steps to the goal. So the goal is something that somebody is motivated to do. So for example, cooking, if the person's cooking motivated, they're more willing to do work towards that goal and maybe do some decluttering to prepare to cook. But goals at the incorrect stage of change, like that hoarding intervention, so having somebody declutter, but they don't wanna do that, um, those interventions are not aligned with the client's motivation and the individuals show an inability or unwillingness to work on an intervention, and the individuals may show frustration. So the example of hoarding, if you have a decluttering intervention, the person doesn't want to do it, what's going to happen if you keep going there saying, hey, let's declutter, let's declutter, and the person says that they don't want to? What's likely to happen if somebody goes and tries to provide this service and the person does not want to work on it? What's the person eventually going to do? melt down, right? Get angry, get sad, shut down. Maybe not return your calls. Maybe not open the door. Lose trust. They'll dig in, right? So fight, flight, they'll do something. It's not going to be good. They're not going to do work on it. And this is where you get the issue of resistant clients, right? They're not picking up. They they get upset every time you call, right? So working on interventions, where the person doesn't, isn't motivated to do it can, can really produce a certain type of resistance, can produce a tension between you and the person who's getting the service provided. Yeah, they might, you know, it might cause anxiety, Joel, for their hoarding, and their hoarding might be triggered by anxiety, and it might actually make the hoarding worse. Absolutely. So, so just in terms of the stage of change, so thinking about resistance to services a little bit differently, that in fact, if you work with someone's motivation, they're more likely to actually want to work on something versus kind of push back and, um, and, um, and not work on it because you're working on something they're not in a place to work on. Yeah, exactly. And let's just say I have hoarding absolutely in my family. Um, and these are people <laughs> who are like functional working adults. And like, yeah, if you were to try to unclutter their garage, they would melt down or stop talking to you, right? If I brought up with a family member, hey, let's clean out your garage, eventually they'd stop picking up my call, right? So this is within families. It's not just for people being, this is how all of us react when there's stuff we don't want to work on. It's not just the, the clients that we're, that we're working with. Um, so, <laughs> I like that support, Joel, for Kelly, not forcing her to do the, the cleaning out. So, um, we're moving towards the edge of the end of the training. So, I put the evaluation in the, um, in the chat. It is helpful for folks to take the evaluation. I really appreciate it. 
So last, next week is the last session of these six. This has been very enjoyable and I really appreciated all of your participation and getting to know you guys. This is the last one that I'm gonna be um, presenting. Um, so next week with Emily, but I'll, I'll be on next week. Um, so for the final training next Tuesday, August 11th, um, I'd like you to try planning and teaching a skill using the skill teaching template. Right? So reflect on what worked well, what was challenging. So try to actually use the template to teach a skill. Um, I'm going to put the template back in the chat just so that everyone has access to it. I did email it to the two people who emailed me. Um, and again, if you weren't able to access the template, which you'll need for this learning application, you can email me um, there and I will send you that. I am again going to ask HCA to send you guys the presentations and PowerPoints. Um, and hopefully they will do that soon. We want you to have access to them. Um, I'm going to again put the, yes, I'm going to put that link also, Angela, to register for the next and last. Um, I'm putting all the links in the chat. Sorry, Emily isn't here. So I'm doing all the links in the, um, yeah, and I really appreciate all the back and forth and the support that you guys are giving each other. It's really, this has been a great thing to see, especially with this group in terms of support. So again, the learning application, try to use the template to do teaching, what worked well, what was challenging, and what additional resources or skills would be helpful to use this. So try using the template. I put it back um, in the chat. So um, in case you don't have it, again, Emily is going to be presenting, providing, and documenting um, services. The link is in the chat. Um, thank you, Lance. Thank you, um, Patricia. We, we went through all the material. Um, yeah, so please do the evaluation. Sign up for the next training. Um, again, the SAMHSA toolkit I put back in the, the, um, the chat and also the link to the skills teaching. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to stop the, uh, stop the recording now.